Salty Stadium for all the worship this morning. I'll be reading from Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your constant love and truth. We sing it, we bow down. <laughs> Father, we are so thankful to be able to be here today, to meet with you around your table, and to hear your word proclaimed. We just pray that you will be with all of us, be with Jeff as he brings the message this morning. And Father, we just pray that everything that's done here will be bring glory to you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
I'll be reading this morning from 1 Corinthians 11, starting with verse number 17. Now, in giving the following instruction, I do not praise you, since you come together 
not for the better, but for the worst. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. There must, indeed, be factions among you, so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper ahead of others. So one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you look down on the church of God and embarrass those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you for this. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed. Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. So a man should examine himself in this way. He should eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly evaluating ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brother, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. And I will give instructions about the other matters whenever I come. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. And Father, we're thankful for this meal. Father, we understand what this meal means to you and to your church. Father, we also understand the cost that was involved in establishing this meal. Father, we're thankful that you have left this remembrance for us so that we can purposefully meet together as your church 
and celebrate what this meal represents. Because, Father, we understand that Jesus died. But, Father, we also know that he rose again. And that's what we're here to celebrate. The resurrection. Because Jesus is alive. And because he is alive, then we have hope. Father, may we always take this time very seriously. May we honor this meal that you have given to us. Father, you are a great God. You're such a loving, giving, and compassionate God. Thank you, Father, for this meal. And now, Father, as we begin to share this meal together, we ask the Lord that you forgive us of our sin. And we ask you, Father, to forgive us in the exact same way in which we choose to forgive those who sin against us. These things we pray in Jesus. Galatians 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also, I went up according to Revelation and presented to them the gospel I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders, so that I might not be running or have run the race in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. This issue arose because of false brothers smuggled in, who came in secretly to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Now from those recognized as important, what they really were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to me. On the contrary, 
they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. Since the one that worked in Peter for the apostleship to be to the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles, and James, Cephas, and John, recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to me, Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only that we would remember the poor, which I made every effort to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles, for certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, because he feared, feared those from the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you, who are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that no one is justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. But as we ourselves are also found to be sinners, while seeking to be justified by Christ, is Christ then a promoter of sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild the system I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. For through the law I have died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Kids are dismissed. Father God, we come to you this morning. Father, we must choose to humble ourselves before you. As once again this week, you displayed your power. Father, we acknowledge that that is just a drop in the bucket of your unlimited power. And Father, we as a community have a choice in how we respond to this display of your power. <coughs> Father, we are thankful that no lives were lost. Father, we're thankful that so many people were willing to help others 
and are still helping us through this difficult time. So Father, we pray that our community will take the time to stop and consider you. Consider your power and your might. Consider your control over nature. To consider your wrath. But to also consider your mercy and compassion. Father, while tornadoes are so devastating, Yet, Father, we can see how you are in control. In times like this, there are many questions. But, Father, may we always look to you and realize that you are God, that you are in control. You always take care of your people. Father, we ask today that all of the men who are gathered here today who are fallen will choose to look to you as the example of what a good father thinks and does. <coughs> father, we're thankful your example. We're thankful for the leadership that you provide to us. May we as fathers choose to honor and glorify you by acting the way you would have us to act. And now, Father, as we get ready to approach your scriptures, we pray, Lord, that you'll forgive us of our sins. And we ask you, Lord, to forgive us in the exact same way in which we choose to forgive those who sin against us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready to study the scriptures? Amen. For the law and testimony, then, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Today we'll be looking at verses. 11 and 12. What we see in the remainder of chapter 9 is Solomon going back to some of the issues in life. Last week we looked at the fact that Solomon commanded us to enjoy the gifts that God had given to us. And now on the basis of that, Solomon continues this discussion all the while taking us back to what we talked about last week. I have some questions for you this morning. First question I have is this. Is man self-sufficient? No, we're not. But oftentimes that's what Humanity believes, isn't it? There are many today who believe that mankind is the greatest and strongest power that exists, and that man is indeed self sufficient, but we know that is not correct. Does humanity have the power to ensure the proper outcome of its efforts? What's the answer to that question after this past week? No. And are there any guarantees that my plans will succeed? Are we promised by God that our plans will always succeed? We're not. Even when people have 
bumper stickers and mugs and signs that would argue different. But we understand what the scripture teaches. Let's look at our text for this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Again, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong or bread to the wise or riches to the discerned or favor to the skillful, rather time and occurrence. That word that Solomon uses does not mean chance, if we understand chance. What he's saying is, is that time and occurrences happen to all of them. For man certainly does not know his time. Like fish caught in a cruel net, or like birds caught in a trap. So people are trapped in an evil time as it suddenly falls on them. People are trapped in an evil time as it suddenly falls on them. What Solomon is telling us this morning is this. He is telling us that our abilities are no guarantee of success. Many choose to believe that they have the power, that they have the ability, that they have the skill set required to be successful. But that is not always and what Solomon echoed in Psalm 127 verses 1 and 2 he echoes here again when he talks about the fact that humanity needs God in order to accomplish anything and while it is generally true that the fastest runners win the races all of our track and cross country coaches that we have here in the congregation usually the fastest person wins right but not always right not always and it's generally too that the strongest soldiers and sailors that's for you son win the battles and the smartest and most skillful workers win the best jobs it is also true that these same gifted people can fail miserably because of factors out of their control so there are some things that we need to learn from life. The successful person knows how to make the most of time and procedure. And that's what Solomon was talking about back in chapter 8 in verse 5. But still, there are times of trouble. This is what Solomon is talking about in these two verses this morning. There are going to be times of trouble. So here's our spiritual life principle today. Success comes by the fear of God and doing all things by his power. Number one, your outline this morning. Life is not fair. Life is not fair. Why is life not fair? Is, is God unfair? 
Yeah, that's where we have to begin this discussion. God is not unfair. God is holy. So when we talk about this idea that life is not fair, then we have to realize that there's something else besides God to be brought into this equation. Let's begin here, letter A. Life is not fair because God allows us to live. By right, by law, by dictating, when we sin, what should happen to us? Not just spiritually, but also physically. Because sin is the ultimate death penalty, both spiritually and physically. So based upon God's law, God had every right to take Adam and Eve's life in the garden. That's what's fair. Fair is getting what we've earned. So the fact that you and I are here today is proof that life is not fair. And certainly, from that perspective, we're all thankful. Aren't we? So, then why? Well, let it be. Life is not fair because sin exists in God's creation. What is it that brought unbalance and disharmony into God's creation? Sin. Sin. So, why? Were there tornadoes in our community this week? Because sin exists. Because sin exists. There were no tornadoes in the garden of Eden. So there has to be a reason why these things happen. And it's because sin exists in God's creation. What is man's greatest problem? Sin. We saw that manifested in nature this very week. So when we're having discussions with people, why did God let this happen? Why the destruction? The answer is simply this. Because sin exists. Those tornadoes were not God's fault. They're our fault. Those tornadoes came through this community sin exists. So, because life is not fair, let her see, we will meet up with difficult times. You ever had a difficult time in your life? Anybody here never had any difficulty in their life? Yeah, I didn't think so. So why do we have difficult times? We have difficult times because sin exists. 
There were no difficult times in the Garden of Eden. There are no difficult times in heaven. And there will be no difficult times on that new earth. Amen? So our goal is to get through these difficult times in this realm so we can experience the full goodness of God on that new earth. Number two in your outline this morning. Not everything goes according to plan. Does it? Boy, we can plan and we can prepare and then something can happen. Right? It just happens. Letter A, the swift doesn't always come out the winter. I have always told you that, that God has a sense of humor. I'm, I'm aware of God's humor every morning when I look at myself in the mirror. Amen, brother? Yeah, he was thinking that too, wasn't he? About, no, about me. Yeah, you think that about me, wasn't he? So it's all right. I love you, brother. But God has a tremendous sense of humor. And sometimes it's, it's, it's fun to see that humor in some of the stories in the scriptures. Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 2. thought maybe a little bit of biblical humor might be good today. Do you realize that while David was God's chosen person, he had a very difficult life? It was always a struggle for David. His children turned against him. And here in 2 Samuel, we have recorded for us a battle. Beginning in verse 17, we'll pick up the story there. The battle that day was extremely fierce. And Abner and the men of Israel were defeated by David's soldiers. The three sons of Zariah were there. Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Asahel was a fast runner like one of the wild gazelles. Mike, would you like to have a runner that was like the wild gazelle? No, I'd rather have one that jumped along the road and went very fast. How do you know that? He chased Abner 
and did not turn to the right or the left in his pursuit of him. Abner glanced back and said, Is that you? Asahel. Yes, it is, Asahel replied. Abner said to him, Turn to your right or left, seize one of the young soldiers, and take whatever you can get from him. But Asahel would not stop chasing him. Once again, Abner warned Asahel, Stop chasing me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How could I ever look at your brother Joab in the face? But Asahel refused to turn away. So Abner hit him in the stomach with the end of his spear. The spear went through his body and he fell and died right there. When all who came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died, they stopped. So was Asahel the swiftest? He didn't win the battle. No, he did not. Then let her be. The stronger does not always defeat the lesser. Go back to 1 Samuel 14. Samuel 14 will begin through 1323. It says, Now a Philistine garrison took control of the pass at Michmash. That same day, Saul's son Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapon, Come on, let's cross over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. However, he did not tell his father. Saul was staying under the pomegranate tree in Migron on the outskirts of Gibeah. The troops with him numbered about 600. Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod, was also there. He was the son of Ahiatub, the brother of Ichabod, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the Lord's priest at Shiloh. But the troops did not know that Johnson, Johnson had left. There were sharp columns of rock on both sides of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine garrison. One was named Bozes, the other Sine. One stood to the north in front of Michmash, and the other to the south in front of Eva. Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapons, Come on! Let's cross over to the garrison of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. His armor bearer responded, Do what is in your heart. You choose. I am right here with you, whatever you decide. All right, Jonathan replied. We'll cross over to the men. Then let, us, let them see us. If they say, wait until we reach you, then we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come on up, then we'll go up, then we'll go up, because the Lord has handed them over to us. That will be our sign. They let themselves be seen by the Philistine garrison. And the Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews are coming out of the hole where they had been hiding. The men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer, Come on up and we'll teach you a lesson, they said. Follow me, Jonathan told his armor bearer, for the Lord has handed them over to Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him. Jonathan cut them down, and his armor bearer followed and finished them off. In that first assault, Jonathan and his armor bearer struck down about 20 men. And it 
halfway through the season. Now, who do you think should have won that battle? The Philistines, but who won the battle? Jonathan and his army. Things are not always going to turn out the way we want them to turn out. There are times in life when we work so hard for something and it doesn't pan out. We experience loss in this life. So, this is something that we have to accept. This is what life looks like because sin exists in God's creation. So as Solomon says, there are evil times in our life. We are going to suffer loss. We're going to suffer disappointment, heartache, real pain and suffering because life is not fair. Life is not fair because sin exists in God's creation. Number three, your outline is plain. So because life is not fair, how, how do we respond? What do the people of God do once we recognize the fact that life is not fair and life is never going to be fair as we pray? Well, number three, it is best to trust in the Lord and rely on Him. Because ultimately, who is in control? God is in control. He is in absolute total control. So what should we learn from this principle? Well, letter A, we are to work hard and give it our best. We've talked a lot throughout Ecclesiastes about work. Work is part of creation. We were all created to work. We've all been created to accomplish something. And just because life is unfair, just because all of our plans do not succeed. That does not give us the right to quit. There's not a single verse in the scriptures that tell you and tell me that it's okay to quit. Is God a quitter? Is Jesus a quitter? Should we be a quitter? No. Regardless of what happens in our life, whether good or bad, we must never be quitters. We are to work hard and to give it our best. But here's what we have to realize. Let it be. God will ultimately determine the outcome of our efforts. We must plan we must work, we must persevere. But whatever success that we have is not ours. We do not succeed on the basis of our abilities. When we succeed, we succeed because God allows us to There is no such thing as a self-made man or a self-made woman. Nothing is accomplished without God. And oh, how I wish our nation would understand this. <laughs> so yes, we must meet our responsibility. But even when we meet our responsibility, that does not mean that we will have the success that we are looking for. And 
that's okay. God is good. And if God is good, He allows our plans to fail. But is that not what's best for us? Think about this church. Everybody wants to talk about being a Christian. In order to be a Christian, there are certain things that we must say about God. And then be consistent across the entire spectrum of life. We must confess that God is good. Because God is holy. And if God is holy, God is good. And he's always good. And everything that he does is always good. Even when what he says is best doesn't match up with what I say is best. So when I work and when I play, and when I determine, and then my plans fall apart, what must be my response? Well, let me tell you what Joe did, and I think it's wise for all of us to have this scripture in our mind. Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. And naked I shall return. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Praise be the Lord. God does not exist to make our life easy. God is more concerned about your life after here than he is your life here. And when God steps into our life, he does so with the singular purpose of helping us get to that new earth. That is God's desire for you. God wants you to be with him on that new earth. And he will do whatever is necessary to help you to make the right choices so that you can get there. So, let her see. There may be blessings or there may be curses. And isn't that how God has acted since the beginning? There are times in our life when we'll experience evil occurrences. There are times in our life when our plans will fail miserably. There'll be times in our life when we have worked and worked and worked and then all of a sudden it's gone. And in those situations, like in all situations, how should we respond 
as authentic disciples of Christ. He set himself down. God's poured out his wrath on Morrow County. <coughs> I will see death and see Satan. Now, how do I respond to that truth? Do I look around at other people? Or do I look in? Why did it happen? Why were some spared and others not? Well, Solomon has told us we'll never know. But it does give me an opportunity to set the self judgment. that we have ultimately comes from God. There's a lot of wisdom in what Job said when we look back over this past year. The Lord given, the Lord taketh away. Anybody have to scrape frost off their windshield this morning? Boy, wasn't that nice. Almost 100 degrees earlier in the week, it got down in the 40s last night. Praise the Lord. The rest. A brief rest. Let's ponder. Am I trying to do it on my own? This is one of humanity's biggest problems. We live under the false assumption that we can do it on our own. And in our particular culture, in our particular nation, this is even magnified. Most people groups around the world understand that the group is more important than the individual. And that whatever is accomplished is a group effort, not an effort by an individual. So one of the real problems that we have in our country is we, we have this idea of individualism. Did God ever create humanity to go alone? No. 
So this idea of individualism is not something that God has promoted, is it? Who promotes individualism? Satan does. Satan does. So am I trying to do it on my own? And if you are, are you tired of it? Are you tired of trying to do it on your own? You will be if you're not. Because when I try to do it on my own, when I when I believe that my success is determined on how hard I work or how hard I try, and I and I honestly believe I have to do it on my own. Because if I don't do it on my own, somebody will view me as weak or a failure. Then yes, I end up exhausted. And that exhaustion leads to depression. And depression then leads to all other things in life. If you haven't figured it out already, you were never meant to do it alone. Will I confess that I am powerless without God? If you want real success in your life, this is mandatory. Now we're talking about success as defined by God, not by you. But if, if you want to become like Christ, if you want to grow spiritually, you have to do this. Even Christ himself in the flesh acknowledged his powerlessness without the Father. Did Jesus raise himself from the dead? No, he did not. The Spirit raised him from the dead. What changes do I need to make in order to live my life differently? Life is a journey. It's a difficult journey. And as we live this life, as we take this journey, we're taking it together. But there's always changes that need to be made. We will only be what we were intended to be when we leave this world. Up until that point in time, whenever God calls us home, then we have the responsibility to continue to self, sit in self judgment and make the necessary changes that produces fruit in us, draws us closer to God, and encourages us to finish. what's necessary, will I do what's necessary to overcome this world win that crown of eternal life. Let's stand and sing. There's a fountain
So I'll be standing for a benediction, please. Thank you, ladies. Our God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for your love and your goodness. As we go from here, may we bring glory to your name. May we serve you and return again to worship, to study, and to fellowship together. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you.